Well, when you've got a lot of money in a capitalist country and that money is influential, like you use it. That's what happened. Unless somebody stops you or unless there's a law passed. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Recently, we had Jamie Raskin, the Congress member, uh, on the podcast. And, and if you haven't heard that episode, I really recommend it. And one of the things that's striking about talking to Congressman Raskin, who's serving on the January 6th committee, is that he refers to what happened on January 6th as a fascist coup or a would-be fascist coup sometimes. And, you know, that's very powerful, powerful language. And I think it's powerful language because it's the kind of language we don't normally think of in an American context. And that's, I think, part of the power of that phrase and the effect of it. I think it's probably also true about insurrection. All these kind of linguistic terms we've grappled with to describe what happened to American democracy tend to have these associations with foreign countries. But there's actually a fascinating footnote (laughs) uh, on that about a fascist coup plot in the United States, at least one that was alleged. And in 1934, one of the most decorated Marines, General Smedley Butler, testified before a House congressional inquiry and then subsequently made that public that he had been recruited by a Wall Street bond salesman and another high-ranking military official to essentially be the figurehead for a fascist coup against FDR, that a combination of right-wing business interests who hated the new president and thought he was a communist and thought he was extinguishing American liberty and was going to destroy American capitalism, along with veterans and active duty members who were sympathetic to that cause, would unite and march an army of, Butler said that he was promised 500,000 troops on the Capitol under the false pretense that FDR was sick, and declare Butler and maybe someone else as the kind of, you know, reigning dictator of the country. I mean, this was front page news in the New York Times and I think the Philadelphia Inquirer and other places. Subsequently, it's unclear if such a coup plot existed. We'll we'll get into that a little bit. I think the judgment of history is that it certainly was nowhere near as developed as maybe Butler made it out to seem. But Butler would then go on to spend the next years of his life has this kind of fascinating leftist gadfly voice against the predations of American capitalism and American imperialism. And in fact, he gave a speech, uh, which later became a book called War is a Racket, in which he basically said that he spent the duration of his career as a U.S. Marine operating in all sorts of fronts of American empire as a hired gunman, a racketeer for capitalism, as he put it, that basically the the army provided the force and the guns, the extortionary thuggery for the machinations of big business. And Butler's, he's a fascinating character. I had encountered the sort of allegation of the coup plot at one point. There was a book, I think, written on it. It might have, there might have even been a movie at one point, I think, about the coup plot. But there is this incredible new biography out of Smedley Butler. It's the product of many years of work, and it ends up being this prism through which to view, essentially, the establishment of of the American empire. And I don't, like, you know, we talk about American empire in the late 20th century sense or in the 21st century sense when we talk about American projections of force abroad or the use of drones in various countries and theaters of combat. The American empire constructed in basically from the 1890s to the 1930s, particularly 1880s to the 1930s, is just a literal one. Like the reason that we have, you know, American Samoa or Puerto Rico or Guam or various different territories, because like we just straight up went and took these places and made them part of America in the like traditional empire uh, fashion. Butler is there as a kind of zealot character throughout the creation of this. And this book serves as this incredible window into this period and the construction of American empire. It's called The Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. And the author is a journalist, Jonathan Katz, who's a publisher and writer of the Racket newsletter on Substack. And I've known Jonathan for a long time. His reporting uh, on Haiti and the earthquake in Haiti it received numerous awards. And it's great to have you, Jonathan, on the program. Hey, Chris, good to see you again. This is such a fascinating topic for a book. So tell me first how you got into Smedley Butler. How did you discover him? I mean, in a word, Haiti. It was when I was working on my first book about the earthquake in Haiti, the big truck that went by, I dug back into Haitian history to explain how things had gotten so precarious that a 7.0 earthquake became the deadliest earthquake ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. And that 
it requires talking about American influence and especially the U.S. occupation of Haiti, which most Americans don't know about, but that started in 1915 and lasted 19 years until 1934. And Smedley Butler was hugely important in that. And when I you know, was looking for more information about Butler in, in case I was going to make him into a character in that book, which he didn't end up being, that was when I encountered this stuff about War is a Racket and the business plot. And it just set me on this question of like, how did this guy who did all of these horrible things in Haiti. And then I found out he also did things like this all over the world. How did he then become, you know, an anti-fascist, an anti-imperialist, uh, an anti-war activist? And that's that's what set me on the path. Yeah, the occupation of Haiti is something that I think most Americans, A, don't know about, and B, even those who do know about it don't quite realize how long it was, that, that it was mm-hmm. under direct American control, which Butler was up near the very top, if I'm not mistaken, right? I mean, he, he was sort of running the island at a certain point. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he so he was part of the initial invasion force in 1915. So it actually starts with a bank robbery. The Marines rob the Central Bank of Haiti in December of 1914. That sets, you know, Haitian politics into a tailspin. And that results in what was the last assassination of a Haitian president until the summer of 2021. And then in response to that assassination, Woodrow Wilson orders a full invasion of Haiti and the ground forces are Marines. So Butler is, you know, he was the head of, of, of one of the battalions who was, you know, the tip of the spear of that invasion. And then he stays for three years um, and ends up actually becoming the head of the client military, the, the Gendarmerie d'IT. And that's Butler's idea. And that the Gendarmerie d'IT sets the model for sort of U.S. trained client, you know, local constabularies that gets repeated in Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. And ultimately, we see it in, you know, Vietnam, Iraq, and, you know, uh, most recently with the with the ANA, the, the Afghan National Army. Let's talk about who Butler was, where he came from, how he became a Marine. So he was from Philadelphia. Uh, specifically, he was from the main line. He was born in a town called Westchester. Um, and he was from a rich Quaker family on the main line. His father was a congressman. His grandfather, Smedley Darlington, who he was named for, uh, his mother's father was also a congressman. And they were just a wealthy, you know, very well-connected family on the main line. And actually, you know, first of all, because he was a Quaker, um, but second of all, because his father, you know, thought that it was sort of beneath their class and station, you know, he didn't want him to go into the military. Uh, in, In 1898, as the war drums are beating against Spain over Cuba, and then the USS Maine explodes, famously. Butler gets kind of caught up in that, you know, kind of 9-11-like moment and lies about his age. He's 16 years old and joins the Marines, but against his father's wishes. And his mother was about as militant as he was. So he, she, she went with him to Washington to sort of sit by as he lied about his age and, and they took him. You know, his father thought he was going to, you know, go to college, that he would be a, you know, a lawyer and a politician like he was. But instead, Smedley goes on this other path and he joins the Marines and stays in it basically for 33 years, going from second lieutenant because, you know, he sort of buys his way into, you know, a a pretty boy junior officer rank. Right. um, All the way up to major general, which was the highest uh, uh, rank available to Marines at the time. Yeah, it's funny in the book for people that don't know this, and I suspect a lot of people do, but like the kind of mainline Philadelphia Quaker establishment is like, a part of an original American establishment, but that is distinct in its own way. You know, it's a it's yeah. a very interesting thing. It's a very rich, long-legged, you know, deep kind of thing to come out of, even to this day. Like, there, those families and those people are still, you know, still there. And that's like a real thing. It's a real kind of hothouse subculture, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things that drew me to Butler as a character, as a historical figure, is that he embodies all of these contradictions that are contradictions of America. And like a lot of that comes from his upbringing because, you know, the the Quakers are a pacifist sect. You know, their one thing is don't serve in the military. And both of his grandfathers uh, served in the Union Army during the Civil War, but that was kind of a special case because... They were also abolitionists, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And, you know, and in 1898, you know, there are a lot of Quakers who are like, you know, this is a, an illegal war. This is a terrible thing. Like, we're going to be imperialists. We can't do this. 
And his mother is, you know, Maude Darlington, who is like an incredible character in her own right. And I, I, I tried, I tried to bring her through in, in the book. It comes through. Um, you know, she, she goes to their meeting um, in Westchester and says basically like either Smedley joins the Marines or he leaves and the Darlington family fortune goes with him. And they relented <laughs> their, their deeply held opposition to war. And, you know, to a certain extent, that kind of Quakerism, you know, he was never really a practicing Quaker, but that kind of Quaker philosophy, egalitarianism, and, you know, anti-war pacifism is in some ways as, you know, close as an explanation as you can get for why a guy who ends up, you know, being twice the recipient of the Medal of Honor and this legendary Marine who's still celebrated in the Corps then ends up being this anti-war activist at the end of his life. Yeah, we should note that the last Quaker president we have, and maybe the only Quaker president, was Richard Nixon, the guy that, you know, bombed the hell out of Cambodia illegally. And Exactly. I can, I can tell you there was another one because it was Herbert Hoover. And I know that because Hoover leads Butler into battle in China and gets him shot. So let's go back to that 18, the late 1890s era in the Spanish-American War, which is, mm-hmm. you know, I think 9-11 is useful for modern audiences that haven't studied this period. If, if you have studied this period, you may have encountered the sort of yellow press and the Hearst newspapers and these incredibly lurid stories of the insanely disgusting and vile deprivations of the Spanish forces on Cuba, much of which was completely fabricated or wildly embellished, mm-hmm. that produced this kind of this kind of war fervor in the United States. Take us back a little bit to that moment since that's so key in propelling him both into that conflict and then that conflict as a kind of beginning point of this period of American empire. Yeah, so, you know, Cuba famously, or if you look at a map, is very close to the United States, very close to Florida. And Americans had had their eye on Cuba since the beginning. I mean, Jefferson wanted to annex it. There were, you know, plots to annex it under, you know, Franklin Pierce. Uh, you know, Jefferson Davis was a big proponent of, of annexing Cuba before our civil war. And Cuba was in, in, you know, it had been a Spanish colony for 300 years, basically since Christopher Columbus dropped anchor in Guantanamo Bay in 1494. And the Cubans had been fighting for their independence for 30 years by 1898. And, you know, they were fairly close to winning it, but there had been, you know, there was a, just a concerted effort by what you know you would call like a war caucus. Um, they're often referred to as the Jingos, where the idea of, of Jingoism comes from. And the biggest, loudest, and most powerful of the Jingos was Theodore Roosevelt, who at that time, at the beginning of this war, was the sec- assistant secretary of the Navy, but obviously would be very highly promoted uh, shortly thereafter. And this war caucus was beating the drums really loudly because they wanted the United States to come and intervene on behalf of the Cuban Mambises, the Cuban independence fighters, against the Spanish Empire. And everybody sort of had their own, just like with Iraq, um, you know, there, there's sort of shades of Ahmed Chalabi, right? Everybody sort of had their own idea of how this would go. Like the Cubans who are asking for American involvement are like, you'll come in, you'll help us beat the Spanish, we'll be independent, and, you know, Biba Cuba. And, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is like, we'll get a, we'll get a colony. Right, like, right. We're going to become like, we're going to become an empire. This is great. Perfect. Um, I'm going to, I'm actually going to quit, you know, assistant secretary of the Navy and form an army unit. Ride around on horseback. Yeah. We'll name them the Rough Riders after Buffalo Bill's, you know, Wild West show. And that's kind of the moment that, that gets Butler involved. You know, the headline moment that, you know, people learn about in high school is the destruction of the USS Maine. The question that should follow is why was a U.S. battleship in Havana Harbor to blow up in the first place? And the answer was that the McKinley administration, on Roosevelt's urging, sent one of its first two steel battleships to Havana in a show of strength because there was already a war going on. And, you know, all the evidence, basically, the best guess is that it was an accident. But the Yellow Press, William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer, for whom the Pulitzer Prizes are named, they kind of take advantage of this moment. And there really were, there really were real abuses going on. I mean, the Spanish were horrible in Cuba. They, they invented concentration camps and, you know, all kinds of forms of torture to torture the, the Cuban independence fighters and civilians back into submission. And by the way, the first place that the Americans take, the first place that the Marines take- the first place. Is, is amazing. Guantanamo Bay. Right. And so Butler, in the summer of 1898, comes to Guantanamo 
And uh, he's and his career begins, and the American overseas empire begins, and the book begins, essentially. Yeah, and and part of what's fascinating here, right, is that it's always important to sort of reground yourself in American history because you realize how little is new. But all of the contradictions of kind of like liberal, hawkish, you know, humanitarian war, American empire, which is kind of a contradiction in terms because we threw off an empire, so we don't want conquest. They're all there in this episode. I mean, it's it's your point about like the Spanish really are awful. And like they were like in the same way that Saddam Hussein genuinely was monstrous. You know, like a lot of things are true. The Cubans really do want the Americans. They really do want to be independent. There's a lot of sort of like self-deception about what we're up to. There's also like straight up colonial imperatives. There's also a lot of racism about who these people are and like the white man's burden. Like all this stuff is mixed in this cocktail you know, a hundred years before these debates around the war on terror, Iraq, and all that stuff. But it's all present there. It's really striking how much that's the case. Yeah, it's all there. It's all there at the beginning. So the Spanish-American War is the beginning of this period of a bunch of imperial skirmishes that Butler will sort of move his way through. Let's talk about some of those, maybe. And I don't know what the sure. best order to do them. And if you want to do in chronological order, there's there's the Philippines, Nicaragua, Haiti, a Dominican Republic, all of these happening around this period, all of which Butler is involved in. Yeah, so I would put, I would kind of put them in, in a series of bucket, maybe uh, uh, organized by chronology. So in the war against Spain, crucially, when Congress declares war, we declare war on the entire Spanish empire, not just in Cuba. And that includes all the Spanish colonies, which includes Puerto Rico, which remains a U.S. colony, we take it at that moment. We also use the cover of war to seize um, Hawaii, whose queen had been overthrown in a private American, white American coup of like sugar growers a couple of years before that, and the Philippines, which is in a lot of ways the big prize. And there's a big debate going into the war about whether to annex Cuba as like a fully owned colony. And actually, like some Americans in Congress were so racist that they didn't want to annex Cuba because they were like, there are all these Black people... <laughs> and they're Catholic, and they speak Spanish, and we don't want them in our country. And so they kind of they kind of write in this proviso in the Declaration of War called the Teller Amendment, which says that we won't annex Cuba, but it says nothing about annexing the rest of Spain's colonies. So that's how we end up with— It should be noted, just to, to, to further this point, which you, you bring out in the book, and, and which is part of the history too, that it's the, the pro-annexation forces who are the less racist— more egalitarian in this argument because they're like, well, we'll just make them Americans. It'll be, it'll, it'll be part of America. And the, it's the it's the racist right. forces saying, no, 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 we do not want those people as Americans on equal footing with American citizens. Exactly. And 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 the compromise, and uh, you know, anybody who's listening in Puerto Rico will know exactly what I'm talking about immediately, are a series of Supreme Court cases called the Insular Cases, yeah. where essentially the Supreme Court decides that just because the United States flag is flying over your house and the United States military is controlling you doesn't mean that you have any rights as an American citizen or any protections under the Constitution. And so in that moment, we do the same thing in the Philippines that we do in Cuba. We ally with the Filipinos against the Spanish and then betray them. But because there's no protection against annexing the Philippines outright, we then do that. And that starts a war against the Filipinos is known as the Philippine-American War. And Butler, he's immediately, you know, he, he comes back from Cuba, uh, hangs out in, you know, yellow fever quarantine for a little bit, and then gets sent to the Philippines because, and this is important for understanding why it's the Marines specifically that do all these things, the Marines are troops, they're, they're ground infantry under direct control of the federal government. At that moment, the army is more under control of the states. You've got these sort of state militia, state volunteer forces. And while Congress is debating whether to expand the size of the standing army, the Marines are available because the Marines are the Marine infantry. They're the infantry of the Navy, which is under direct federal control. So McKinley is able to send them out. And Butler goes to the Philippines and participates. And, and the first time he actually goes into battle. He leads his troops into an ambush, actually. But the first time he goes into battle um, is in the Philippines at the Battle of Novaleta. And that war is both brutal and an incredible ideological whiplash because the entire casus belli of the Americans 
turns around in a matter of years. I mean, the, the, the ostensible story is that America doesn't take empires, doesn't seek conquests. We're the, we're, we believe in independence and self-determination. Look at us, the colonies. And we go in to boot out the bad Spanish, then take it over and find ourselves on the other end of basically the exact same independence forces we had putatively been yep. on the side of to liberate and are every bit as brutal, I think, arguably, as the Spaniards were. Like, we just literally take over the role of colonial overseer in a matter of a year or two in which we had justified our yep. entrance yep. as liberators. Yeah, so we get into this war, the war against Spain, because of uh, the policy of reconcentration, of, of concentration camps. We set up concentration camps in the Philippines. We learn this form of torture called the water cure from the Spanish and use it against the Filipinos. Simplistically, it is waterboarding, but it is actually worse than waterboarding because you're actually pouring water into like the head. Like you're like one of the descriptions of it is that you swell up uh, the belly of of the victim and in, in, until like they've they've swollen up like a toad. Yeah, and they and we're we're just doing the thing. And at that moment, so Teddy Roosevelt, um, he does not come off looking very good in in gangsters or or in this period of history. No, there's so many different parts of Roosevelt. But we get the full racist imperialist yeah. part in this chronicle. And, you know, he so he he has quit the Navy. He's gone and, and served in the military in Cuba. He then becomes vice president. And then during this war becomes president when, when William McKinley is assassinated. And Roosevelt is, he's really adamant about it. He's really out in front about it. I mean, it's sort of on the side later in life where he sort of, you know, remarks to a British friend, you know, I, I am, as I, w- I thought I would be, you know, a pretty good imperialist. But he's very much adamant that he's an expansionist. He's adamant that he is, you know, growing the power of the United States, using the Navy, using military force, and using commerce. Like, we're, we're going to just sort of open new markets. We're going to force them open with the military. We're going to take them over. And he puts it in white supremacist terms. I mean, he he talks about how, you know, the waste spaces of the world, you know, should be the inheritance of the white and optimally English-speaking races, as he calls them. And that's what we're doing. But, you know, we win that war. It's 1899 to, to 1902. And then actually fighting continues for another decade after that in the southern provinces of the Philippines. But it's at a great cost. You know, first of all, I mean, and this isn't the part that Americans care about, but as many as, you know, three quarters of a million Filipino civilians die in this war. Thousands, I think it's like 6,000 American troops are killed. It costs, you know, millions of dollars. And even for the expansionists, you know, and and there starts to be blowback because, you know, Mark Twain, you know, we we read Huck Finn. At the end of of Twain's life in this period, he is a huge anti-imperialist and a very poison pen one. Yeah. And he's really, you know, hilariously, but, he, you know, he's sort of like, you know, Daily Show style. But he's he's lampooning and, and really savaging what the Americans are doing in the Philippines and also in China, where Smedley Butler goes with the Marines in response to the Boxer Rebellion, which is a whole other thing that we could talk about. But these moments, they're starting to get blowback in the United States among, among the American population. And so at that moment, we see this turn and we go to the next bucket, and, and this is where Butler sort of ends up in, in Central America, are ways of doing sort of imperialism a little bit more on the sly and a little bit farther out of public view and public celebration. And so that's where first, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's big idea is that, you know, we're going to, we're going to dig a canal, also an old idea, but we're going to dig a canal to connect the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And that ends up requiring the forced secession of the Departamento de, de Panama, the, the state of Panama, from Colombia in order to get the full rights and the full sovereignty that you know the Americans want. And the Marines go do that. And then in order to sort of secure the sea lions to the Panama Canal and also, you know, provide entry to, you know, the fruit companies and to the banks, the Marines go and engage in a phrase that people may sort of dimly remember from from high school history, dollar diplomacy, where instead of saying, we're going to take Honduras, we're going to take Nicaragua as a colony, like we did in the Philippines, 
we're going to sort of ally with local forces. And instead of betraying them outright, we're going to sort of fund them and also take over the economy by taking over the bank and taking over the currency by issuing a U.S.-backed currency um, and, you know, create debt that they're never going to be able to pay off. And in doing that, sort of get these not de jure colonies, but de facto colonies that we then end up, you know, controlling throughout the 20th century. Yeah, let's just to talk about that transition, which is so fascinating from the sort of outright like conquest, because the Philippines really is a kind of high watermark of that sort of thing. And also kind of an embarrassment. I mean, again, it's always great because contemporary sources recognize the hypocrisies, like your point about Twain. It's like they knew back then that like the U.S. had done an absolute 180 on its feeling about self-determination to the Filipino people. Like there were many contemporary critics pointing that out, Quakers, Twain, others. That the other thing that comes through in, in your writing about this and in other sources about this era is that like, it's also this moment when American self-conception of no foreign entanglements, you know, George Washington, no standing army, were, you know, that that really is hitting up against this new imperial vision. Yeah. And the people that have a view that are that are anti-imperialist, like that's a, that's a powerful political force. It's not nowhere. And it's particularly because the Philippines becomes a little bit of a cluster those forces gain some strength, and the result of it is this essentially more sophisticated, more hidden, harder to hold accountable version of it, where you're not actually conquering and not actually taking them as colonies, but you're effectively doing that. You're getting all the benefits, but you're keeping the political blowback far, far out of view that had come with the Philippines. Yeah. It bears noting that, you know, in you know, throughout the 19th century, throughout America's first century, we are just violently expanding, seizing land. Yes, of course. Killing people and putting them on reservations. And a lot of the people in this story come directly out of that experience. I mean, people like- That's how they learn to do what they do. Exactly. And people like uh, Adna Chafee, who's an army general, who's very important in the Philippines and commands American forces during the Boxer Rebellion. Howland Jake Smith, who is part of this you know, horrific episode that Butler's mentor, Littleton Waller, is involved in, where we basically, you know, on orders of, of the army, the Marines commit uh, essentially a low-level genocide on the island of Samar. They all learned their trade doing this against the natives on this continent. And what's happening at this moment, and, and you see this happen over and over again in American history, where we've done all these things to get to this point. Some people are like, this works for me. This is good. Let's keep going with this. Let's let's just do Manifest Destiny, but do it in the Philippines. Let's do it in China. Let's just Manifest Destiny the entire world. And other people, some of whom come from traditions like the Quakers that have been, you know, ringing the alarm bell about this throughout, and others, you know, like Twain, who are sort of like, you know, uh, uh, you know. Actually, I'm 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 having different thoughts about this now, and and others like W. B. Du Bois, who have been on the receiving end of this as you know as as racial minorities. All of these people are coming together, and they're all having these fights. And to a certain extent, you know, what we do in Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, you know, in Haiti, to a certain extent, this happens a little bit more off the radar, specifically to keep away from this argument right. which is raging in the United States. But of course, and you know, part of the way that I wrote this book, I mean, it's you know, sort of half biography Smedley Butler, half travelogue. You know, I, I, I go to the countries where these things happen, and I can tell you from their point of view, they're not under any illusions about what's happening. I mean, from the Nicaraguans' point of view, right. they know exactly what's happening, and they know exactly that it's the same thing right. that any empire is doing to any colony, but that plausible deniability is sort of built in for the benefit of Americans. Yeah, just two points to sort of reemphasize here that are important. First of all, the continuity between the, the war on indigenous peoples on the continent and what extends. And in fact, there's this you know famous... Frederick Turner thesis in, in the 1890s, where the 1890 census where he says, you know, the frontier's closed, and it's not a coincidence that this imperial aspiration comes on the heels of that, like exactly. keep manifest destiny. So, and also just which you you write about in the book, the experience of what the US military does between the Civil War and this period is fight and kill indigenous people. 
that it is is main calling card. It's how they come up through the ranks. It's the battles that they have fought. It's the I mean, that is what those 20 or 30 years largely of the US military experience is between the Civil War and the Imperial period. Yeah. The training ground for all of this is quite literally these wars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how does Butler feel about all this? Like, what do we know? You know, as he's doing this, I mean, he's he's very good. He finds that he's very good. Yeah. Very, very good at this. Which is a little surprising, you know, given his background or whatever, that he he's a good leader of men, he's a good commander, and he is rising up through the ranks. What, what does he contemporaneously feel about what his mission is? What is the ideology or the self-justification or mission that these men are telling themselves about what they're doing in these places? Well, when he joins the Marines, he joins the Marines, you know, the, the way he describes it in a memoir that he writes in nineteen in the early 1930s, before the business plot, before Boris Iraq, and before all of that. He talks about how he wanted to shoulder a rifle to, to free little Cuba, is the way he puts it. And sort of like a, it's a paternalistic kind of, and there's like an implicit racism there, right? The idea that like, what the Cuban Mambises, who are like these battle-hardened fighters who've been fighting for 30 years, but what they were really waiting for was like a 16-year-old from Westchester, Pennsylvania to like come in. <laughs> 16-year-old rich Quaker exactly. to, come, to come to their aid. Exactly. But, you know, but, but it has that sort of, you know, small R Republican, small D Democratic ideal that, you know, he's, he's going to be bringing like, you know, yeah. the American way to these, you know, to these. On the side of liberation and independence against occupiers and conquest. Exactly. And they will welcome us as liberators. For the first, you know, decade of his life about, or first decade of of, of his uh, military career, which to a certain, certain extent, it's the first decade of his life. Um, he, he, like, he's not really reflecting on it all that much. He's, he's more concerned with, you know, impressing, you know, the Marines around him, impressing his commanding officers, showing that he belongs. I mean, his, his obsession is with proving that he is not just Congressman Thomas Stalker Butler's, you know, son. And he's not just a, you know, a gilded second lieutenant, um, you know, who's ordering around, you know, these more experienced uh, enlisted Marines around him. And also becoming a man, right? This is the, I write about in the book, but like, yeah. there are these gender politics involved. I believe her name is Kristen Hoganson, um, uh, wrote a book about specifically the Spanish-American War and especially the Philippines about masculinity. And I mean, Teddy Roosevelt is just the strenuous life and he's just out there being like he's, if he could have, I think, made the U.S. flag just a giant phallus and like, he used it, like speak softly and carry a big stick. I, like he's talking about it, maybe a different big stick. Well, and we should also note, I mean, in a kind of like Kendall Roy fashion, yep. Roosevelt's the same. I mean, he's not a Quaker, but he's from this like, Totally cosseted, you know, wealthy, affluent, connected establishment, deputante, ball attending, yep. New York City urban universe. And he's small and he invents tough guy, virile outdoorsman for himself as an identity exactly. out of nothing. Exactly. Like it's it's an entirely constructed vision of masculinity and of his own toughness. And he, as Butler does, puts his body where his mouth is. Like, they do right. actually go to war and risk their lives. But, it, you know, there's a similarity there that's kind of interesting, that these yeah. are people who are creating this identity for themselves. Yeah, and Butler's short. He's, you know, like, I don't know, 130 pounds wet. I mean, he's like, he's like, he's a little guy. Yeah. As are a lot of these guys. A lot of them, a lot yeah. of, like, the, the most legendary Marines. And so, you know, and so that's kind of his focus. By the time he gets to Nicaragua, so he goes to Nicaragua three times. He's based out of the Panama Canal Zone. He's gone back, actually, to the Philippines again, and now he's come back to Panama. He's living there with his wife, Ethel Bunny Butler, um, and his kids in the Panama Canal Zone, which is, you know, a U.S. colony and will, will remain so until essentially, the, you know, 1999. And it, his battalion keeps getting sent to Nicaragua over and over again. And, you know, things aren't going well in Nicaragua for the Americans. There's kind of a, a Teddy Roosevelt-ish president, almost dictator, who is mad at the Americans for not building the canal through Nicaragua. And the Marines go and are sort of intervening on behalf of the United States. But Butler realizes as he's there that he's really intervening on behalf of the banks. That, you know, essentially two banks, in particular Brown Brothers, which is now Brown Brothers Harriman and J.W. Seligman and Company, they found a new Central Bank of Nicaragua, which is incorporated in Connecticut. They create a new Nicaraguan currency. And 
Nick Rogmans don't particularly like this. A lot of Nick Rogmans don't like this. Some do. Some elites, you know, are really into it, but a lot of them don't. And they keep rising up and trying to sort of overthrow the American puppet president. And the Marines have to keep coming back to defend him. And at that moment, and you see this, it's not just Butler. There are other people in the military, in the U.S. military. I mean, they're not dumb. They can see what's happening. Right. There. And and Butler is, you know, writing to his parents, like, you know, they're calling this a revolution, but there's no revolution in this. Like, we're just, we are clearly just doing this because Brown Brothers has some money down here. Now, that doesn't keep him from doing anything. And in fact, one of the sort of, you know, almost footnotes in the book is that Butler ends up overseeing this horrendous battle on a mountain called Coyotepe, which is just outside the city of Messiah. And the revolutionary leader, Benjamin Zeladon, um, gets killed in this battle. And his body ends up getting paraded through the streets of the towns at, at the base of this hill, essentially, at the, at the base of the Messiah volcano. And there is a, a teenage Nicaraguan named Augusto Sandino who sees this grisly procession go by and at that moment is radicalized into a lifetime of revenge and war against the Americans. Sandino's followers are called the Sandinistas, and the Sandinistas that are in power today in Nicaragua under Daniel Ortega take their name from that moment where they were radicalized. But so, so Butler doesn't keep himself from sort of creating these echoes of history, but you can see sort of he starts questioning it. As this goes on, we invade Mexico at the behest of the oil companies. The oil uh, company's lawyer a guy with the recognizable name of William F. Buckley Sr., calls on the Wilson administration and says, like, you know, there's this revolution going on in Mexico, like, we need some protection in the premises. And the Marines and the Navy invade and and ends up being an army occupation in which Douglas MacArthur is involved in Veracruz. Butler then goes to uh, Haiti, which we ultimately invade at the behest of Citibank because... They say the Haitians are owe them money to basically repay loans that the Haitians are using to pay back the French from the Haitian Revolution. These are all very long stories. And then the Dominican Republic. And then, by the way, Butler becomes the head of the Philadelphia police force and militarizes the Philadelphia police. At the end of Butler's military career, he goes back to China one more time. And this is during sort of China's warlord period the Qing dynasty has been overthrown largely. They weren't helped by the fact that, you know, this invasion of which Butler took part in 1900 against the Boxer Rebellion happened. But the Qing dynasty has fallen. There's fighting going on over control of China. And this is the beginning of the Chinese Civil War, which is between the communists and the nationalists under, under Chiang Kai-shek. And it's that that one moment Butler has has gone back as a general. He becomes a general during the First World War. And also his experience in World War I, sort of overseeing a, a disembarkation, reembarkation camp, where he sees, you know, the, the horrors of the soldiers who are coming back from the Western Front. And he's now in China and he sees sort of, he can tell that he's seeing the first stirrings of what is going to be the Second World War in the Pacific. And it's that one moment, he's a general now, he's in charge of American troops, and he's really, to a large extent, the senior military official of all of the the foreign forces that that are stationed in, in China again at this moment. That's the one point where he starts kind of, insofar as a Marine can act as, you know, a pacifist, you see him, you know, keeping his troops out of fights and actively trying to avoid sparking a war between essentially the Chinese nationalists and the Japanese. That's the only thing that I can say, you know, where he's he's still a Marine. He's still, you know, uh, uh, walking around with a swagger stick. It's the only moment where I can say that, you know, he's in uniform and is kind of starting to to think about anti-imperialism and think about activism against war. And then the rest of it happens. So let's talk about the business plot, the fascist coup against FDR, and then where's a racket after we take this quick break. So by 1933, FDR has just won. It's the depths of the Great Depression. The country obviously is in terrible shape. Butler makes this incredibly astounding claim 
give us the context for what Butler's doing at that point, and then talk a little bit about what really did happen here, because I think that's the source of some historical debate. So Butler, essentially at this moment, he's, he's left the Marine Corps. He leaves in 1931. His last hurrah is that he's court-martialed for insulting Benito Mussolini. That's amazing. But, but that's, that's in the book. You can read about it there. But he's essentially on the speaking circuit, which is something that he started doing right before he, he retired. And he's, he's a popular speaker. He's a really charismatic guy. He's funny. He cusses a lot. And people really like him. And, and, and he's kind of made his stock in trade at that moment, sort of telling stories about you know, his adventures overseas, which scandalized a lot of Americans because he's talking about like, well, this is what we actually did in Nicaragua where we fixed these elections. This is, what we, this is how I, you know, you know, dissolved the parliament in, in Haiti at gunpoint. And he's sort of entertaining and also, you know, starting to, to scandalize crowds. And he's also starting to attract the attention of sort of people on the margins of American debate who are either themselves anti-fascist or, or critics of the American government or whatever. What happens in 1933, and we know this because he testifies to this effect in front of Congress. So he, he comes of his own volition and gets the attention of two congressmen in particular, John W. McCormack, who ends up becoming Speaker of the House, long-serving Speaker of the House, and a guy named Samuel Dickstein, who's a, a Democrat from New York uh, and an immigrant to the United States. Uh, he, was, he was born in, in, in the Russian Empire. And Butler comes to them and says, you know, this bond salesman, named Gerald C. McGuire, has been, has been bothering me for two years. And over the last couple months, it's gotten really disturbing. He's asking me to lead a coup against Franklin Roosevelt. And Butler comes and he testifies. He enlists the aid of a journalist named Paul Conley French, who is a reporter for the Philadelphia Record and the New York Post, he kind of does his own independent investigation, but Butler is obviously his, his star source. But he interviews independently McGuire, who tells him, you know, essentially the same thing that he's told Butler. McGuire has been traveling through Europe. He's gone to all the hot spots of 1934. He's in Rome, you know, where Mussolini's in power. He's in Berlin, where Hitler is now chancellor. And he goes to Paris, which is actually the place where he finds the model that he wants Butler to use. It was an anti-parliamentary riot that really, I mean, if you want to talk about things that resemble January 6th. January 6th. 6th. It's, the, yeah. it's the closest historical analog. Absolutely. And we could talk about that in more detail, but he comes to Butler and he's like, I want you to do that. I want you to do that in, in Washington. We should just note, it's, it's, it's a bunch of right, it's a right-wing mob that- yeah marches on the Capitol, <laughs> yes. basically puts it under siege to stop the transfer of power to the new government that they oppose. Yeah, animated in large part by an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, which is based on, like, there was a real guy uh, named named uh, Alexander Stavitsky who who actually was, you know, involved in, in corruption. Um, and then, he, and then uh, he kills himself in 1934, but this meme basically starts in France that Stavisky didn't kill himself. Yes. Um, and that it was a plot done, you know, by, you know, powerful members of the French parliament to uh, keep the heat off, you know, that they were be, you know, being controlled from behind the scenes by this sort of, you know, like Jewish cabal. And so, yeah, so this group of veterans, they're mostly veterans groups and students and some communists, and they all kind of get together and they, and they do this sort of loosely organized kind of crazy riot in which, you know, the people who end up getting killed, just like on January 6th, are almost entirely the rioters. The rioters. Um, but they do succeed in putting the fear of God in the Assemblée Nationale of France. And because it's a parliamentary system, uh, the center-left prime minister resigns in favor of— Resi The government falls. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a kind of a conservative, but somebody who's going to be more uh, acceptable to the fascists— takes power. And this both ends up setting the stage for the Popular Front in France, which is something that Americans could learn from, where liberals and socialists and people on the left kind of work together to stave off fascist control. But it also ends up setting the stage for, for the Vichy regime and the puppet fascist regime that takes power over much of France when, when uh, Hitler invades in 1940. And so Gerald C. Maguire, he says, like he meets with one of these groups, the Croix de Feu, 
the fiery cross. And, you know, he uh, he comes to Butler and he's like, you know, this is the kind of organization that I want you to lead. And in terms of what we know, we know that all of that happened because Maguire, under oath, as he's busy perjuring himself left and right about a bunch of other things, he says, yeah, I met with I met with a quad de feu, but it was at a mass at Notre Dame. Like I just like went on a Sunday morning. They just happened to be there and we hung out for a little while. And yeah, I thought they were pretty cool guys. So just to recap here, so you got this bond salesman. He actually did meet with Butler. He actually did travel through all the fascist hotspots of Europe in 1934, which is a raging set of fascist hotspots from Mussolini's Rome. Hitler, Chancellor Germany, this sort of riot at the National Assembly in France by essentially fascist and fascist forces. Which happens six weeks before Maguire gets to Paris. Like, it's like it's all it's all very fresh. And so he comes before the same committee and he testifies. We know that he was in all those places and he met with Butler and Butler and he both say that he basically said to Butler, I want you to do something like that. Essentially, yeah. He's all over the place with his testimony. At one point, he says that Butler... He was like, the butler came to him and proposed a coup, which makes no sense. My understanding, I mean, again, is that how much this was like weird right. fantasizing cosplay and how much this was a real plot is basically the debate. Okay, so here's what I can tell you about that. So McGuire tells Butler at this sort of meeting where he spills the beans, this should be a movie, right? Like it's at the back of an abandoned cafe that's been shuttered because of the depression uh, in, in, a, in a Philadelphia hotel. And he tells Butler you know, about his trip to Paris and about the Quad de Feu and about his plans for you know, Butler to lead a column of half a million you know, World War veterans armed with rifles from the Remington Rifle Company into Washington. He makes a couple of predictions. One prediction is that this guy, uh, Hugh S. Johnson, who was an army general who Franklin Roosevelt had picked to, to head his National Recovery Agency, He says, you know, we've been meeting with Johnson. We've been talking to him. He's going to get fired in the next couple of weeks. And he gets fired in the next couple of weeks. So that, that prediction comes true. And, and it would, that's, that speaks to some amount of inside information because that wasn't something that, you know, I mean, maybe it was a lucky guess, but it was, it wouldn't have been very easily predictable from the outside. Johnson was sort of looked at as kind of the conservative in the New Deal. He was kind of the right wing. You know, a lot of people sort of looked at him as like the stable, you know, if you were into the right, he was kind of the stabilizing influence in the New Deal. So that was that 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 gives some credence to that. And then he says in the next couple of weeks, there's also going to be an organization that appears. You know, he calls them the villagers in the opera. They're going to be the people who are behind the scenes, funding this effort, making this thing go. And it's called the Liberty League. And it ends up being a thing that it comes into formation a couple weeks later on the front page of the New York Times. And what the Liberty League is, is basically a group of very wealthy and very well-connected individuals, including the DuPonts of the DuPont Corporation, uh, Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors. Um, It's got two former Democratic presidential candidates, John W. Davis and, and Al Smith are involved. You know, the McCann Erickson ad agency, like all of these people. And they make no bones about at least their public-facing goal is to stop the New Deal. People may know about this because they know the history, but like the Koch brothers, American for Prosperity, like, you know, right-wing billionaire industrialists who don't like this Democratic left, you know, liberal president and what he's doing and think it's going to strangle American prosperity and want to end it quite forthrightly and are funding people with reactionary politics like theirs to do so. It's it's amazing how consistent that story is in multiple points of American history. And this is probably the, literally is kind of the model. I mean, it's sort of foundational uh, for for this kind of sort of capitalist, conservative business political activism. Yeah. Well, when you've got a lot of money in a capitalist country and that money is influential, like you use it. Right. That's what happened. Unless somebody stops you. Or unless there's a law passed or something like that. So we know that the Liberty League wanted to, the New Deal undone. What we don't know is the extent to which the big names in the Liberty League were on board with this plan. The one piece of evidence that we have that suggests that there was a plausible connection is Gerald Maguire's boss, Grayson Mallet Provost Murphy. So Murphy was a, he was a Wall Street financier, a big deal at the time. 
And as I write in the book, and this was stuff that I, I hadn't read this laid out like this anywhere else. I kind of learned it sort of late as I was trying to figure out like how real was the business plot. And this is what kind of moves me to the, I think Butler was onto something here. Murphy was kind of the bizarro world version of Smedley Butler. Butler, you know, was kind of the Zelig, the Forrest Gump of American empire from the Marine point of view. Murphy was that from the intelligence point of view. Mm. Butler went to the Haverford College Grammar School. So, like, they even, like, start out in the same, like, spot in Philly. And Murphy goes to West Point. He joins military intelligence. He then goes to, uh, he's in the Philippines. He's in Panama. He's involved in the conspiracy to, you know, sever Panama from Colombia for the purposes of building the canal. He then sort of, after doing the rounds as a formal spy, I mean, he, he's, he's called back to Washington to debrief Teddy Roosevelt about the Panama conspiracy in the middle of it happening in like October 1903. He then goes into finance. His uncle, a Mexican financier named Severo Mallet Provost, is the guy who tells Brown brothers to get involved in Nicaragua. He's like, there's going to be an opening to do dollar diplomacy there. Grayson Malaprovost Murphy, Grayson MP Murphy, uh, then gets involved with JP Morgan and he is, he oversees a loan to the Dominican Republic, a controlling loan there. And he's also involved in other elements of, of their overseas operations because, of course, he's in military intelligence. Like he literally speaks the language. He then goes to Europe oversees the American Red Cross during the First World War while Butler is running his embarkation camp, and then barnstorms across Europe with Murphy's buddy, Wild Bill Donovan, setting up a private intelligence network, and Donovan ends up running the OSS during the Second World War. If you're familiar with those initials, the OSS is basically the, it is what becomes the CIA. Murphy is both Jerry Maguire's boss, his name is Jerry Maguire, by the way. Right. But uh, Murphy is both Jerry Maguire's boss and the treasurer of the Liberty League. So, I mean, that to me, it suggests that, first of all, I'm sure Murphy knew what was going on. And even, I can't remember, it's McCormick or Dick Stein, I think it's McCormick, you know, says like, I found this like an insane thing to say, but he's like, the only reason we didn't, you know, call Murphy to testify is because we already had him cold and we didn't want to give him a chance to like make, ex- it makes no sense. But like, even they knew like Murphy was behind this. The question that I don't know is had Murphy gone to the DuPonts, you know, and been like, we're going to do this coup. We would like your, you know, you own the Remington Arms Company. Like, do you want to get involved? Ha- had he gone to you know, right. Douglas MacArthur and been like, you know, or, or Hugh Johnson and been like, this is happening, you know, are, are you in or out? And we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because there's not really an investigation. The House American Activities Committee, the special committee, they're overseeing a bunch of different cases at that time, including a totally separate case, which is what involves Prescott Bush's bank, which is how Prescott Bush sometimes gets mistaken for having been involved in the business plot. But that's, that's sort of a side story. But Butler testifies, the journalist testifies, McGuire testifies, and the lawyer for another sort of low-level businessman who, who was sort of maybe involved with this at the beginning testifies. And that's it. There's no further investigation. So without the DuPonts coming in and being sworn in and said, you know, did you know? What did you know? And when did you know it? There's no real way to know. And I spent, you know, uh, five years, you know, going all over the world trying to, you know, tell all these stories. And, uh, you know, I tried to do as complete a job as I could, you know, investigating the business plot, you know, someone else, or maybe, you know, for my next project or something, I could go and see if there are, you know, papers that somehow weren't destroyed floating around or something, you know, where there's like some kind of paper trail between Alfred P. Sloan and and Murphy and, and Butler or something like that. But it, it may also be that Butler blew the whistle on this thing before it could really gel. And that's part of the reason why it's been very hard to prove ever since. So after that, the big thing in the sort of closing chapter of his career is the war is a racket speech and the book and then the sort of speaking tour around it. What produces this full turn into a anti sort of 
you know, capitalist interest, (laughs) anti-imperialist figure in the last, say, 10 years of his life. I think he becomes, if not a socialist, he becomes a social democrat. The last vote that he ever makes in a presidential election is in 1936. He votes for Norman Thomas, um, who's the Soviet socialist candidate for president. I think he had had it. (laughs) I think he had just become completely fed up. And, you know, if if there was a decade that was going to radicalize a person, it was the 1930s. Maybe the 2020s as well. I don't know. We'll see. But, you know, it's certainly in his lifetime, the 1930s. I mean, you've got the Great Depression, capitalism in all of its gross predation has just left people starving and destitute. You've got the experience of the First World War. You've got very, very clear signs that another world war that is going to be even worse is in the offing. Right. And Butler goes through the beginning of this decade, like he's very inspired by the New Deal. He actually runs for Senate. The man's everywhere. He runs for Senate in 1932. He gets he gets the living f beat out of him. Um, but but he uh, but he runs uh, like as an independent Republican, but kind of on a New Deal proto New Deal ticket. Um, he's he's calling for sort of a jobs guarantee and and old age insurance and also. Continued prohibition, which is what I think, which is what I think loses in the race. But you know, he he's he's a big supporter of of Franklin Roosevelt, which is is a reason why the business plotters, however many there were, really stupid to approach him. Um, but maybe they wouldn't have realized that. But so you know, he's he's a supporter of the New Deal. He's a supporter of social democracy. He's a supporter of government coming in and and helping people. Right. He's also radicalized by yet another event that's t- talked about in the book called the Bonus March which ends with the army attacking, you know, veterans who've, who've, you know, assembled in Washington, D.C., asking for promised help from the government. And he goes through the business plot and he sees that Congress is going to do nothing to hold the people who he believes are definitely responsible. And he's dealing with moral injury and he's dealing with PTSD and he's dealing with having, you know, spent a lifetime seeing the horrors of war. And he comes up with an answer. And his answer is essentially what ends up being called the military industrial complex. He puts it in this book called War as a Racket, which is a very oversimplified, very, you know, there are errors in it. I mean, it's a blunt book written for a mass audience. And the argument that he's making in War as a Racket is an argument borrowed from, or it's a metaphor borrowed from his his time running the Philadelphia Police Department during Prohibition, where he's fighting against, you know, these gangsters, uh, you know, like Max Boo Boo Hoff and Mickey Duffy, these guys who are connected to to Al Capone, and they they were racketeers. And so in, in War as a Racket, he's saying, well, the real racketeers are the munitions industry. The real racketeers are the capitalists who used you know, soldiers to, you know, defend their turf. And then it's really uh, later in, in 1935, he writes this series of articles that I think often get confused with War as a Racket in a magazine called Common Sense. It was a, a socialist magazine, although it, it identified itself as a non-Marxist socialist magazine. And he writes this series of radical articles where he he decries basically each part of the military you know, in a different article, each one. And it's in the second article called In the Time of Peace, The Army, where he recounts this famous among Butlerites confession of crimes, where he says, I helped in the, you know, the raping of half a dozen Central American republics. I made, you know, Cuba and Haiti good places for the city bank boys to collect revenues. I made China safe for standard oil. I was a racketeer for capitalism. Looking back on it, we Marines could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he did was operate in three city districts. We Marines operated on three continents. And at that point, as a Marine, he knows all about building bridges and he knows all about burning bridges. And he burns the hell out of every bridge that he's had in his life. He even burns his bridges with FDR, who he had risked his reputation to you know, protect from this coup and, and doesn't even vote for him in 1936 because he sees that FDR is moving toward getting the United States involved in a war. And what, what he's really afraid of is war with Japan. Um, he's, you know, he's no, he's no friend to, 
to the America First Committee. He's 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 not an anti-Semite, or he's at least not more of an anti-Semite than anybody from the main line would have been in the 1930s. But he is terrified of seeing another generation of Americans get sent through the sausage maker like they did in the First World War. And he spends sort of the last his last gasps of life in the late 1930s. He dies in 1940, trying to decry the the military-industrial complex, as it gets called, and and try to keep the United States from from getting involved in another war. Uh, The book is called The Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. Uh, It's by Jonathan Katz, who also has a great newsletter called The Racket. The book is phenomenal. I'm making my way through it. It is sprawling, and it's a product of just, I mean, it's incredibly well-written. It's a product of a a shocking and astounding amount of reporting and research. Uh, I I, I can only imagine uh, how much, how long this took. I think it was like seven years you're working on this book. You and I have spoken Mm -hmm. throughout the, the trajectory of it, but it's a really, really phenomenal piece of work. Jonathan, thanks so much. Thank you. This is great. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.